and I think we are live. Hello everyone, welcome to pro -Am Strings and this live class, Henriette Goes Live, that's how we call it. Um, so lovely to see you all here. I'm Henriette, I'm the founder and uh, teacher at pro -Am Strings and we do these classes roughly about once a month for you as my YouTube audience to have an opportunity to ask questions because I very, very much am aware that we it can be quite a lonely business practicing the violin on your own with YouTube films, YouTube videos. It's very effective, but it can feel quite lonely. And this that is why I do these classes, just to connect with you to, for you to get to know me and for me to get to know you a little bit. So the way we are going to communicate is with the chat. And if you've never done this before, do have a go at using the chat. And today I'm going to ask you the question, if you are here and you are following this, can you write in the chat um, what piece you're currently learning? And it doesn't have to be a specific very, very difficult piece, but you could say, for instance, oh, I'm in your um, Suzuki 30 days course lesson three, for instance, or I am playing the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, or you might say, I have not started learning yet. I just wanted to find out a little bit about these courses. So go ahead and write in the chat box and then you hit send and then it, your, your message appears in the chat box for us all to see. Um, so that way we can just check that it's all working correctly and that we can communicate because this is very much um, an opportunity for you to ask questions and for me to answer your questions, but also for you as the audience amongst yourself to uh, give suggestions and to work out things if there is a question that you have come across as well and you have found a solution to the issue that one person uh, writes about then you might write that as well of course very much um, a, a two-way conversation maybe a three-way conversation even so if you're here and I can see there's quite a few people already here um, do come and say hello in the chat box and then once you've done that um, I think you can fire away with your first question. So these first couple of minutes of a live class are always sort of finding out what we're doing, where everyone lives. So if you prefer to write that, this is how we've always done it. Write about where you are in the world, because um, mostly there are people here from every continent and from every part of the world and some people have to get up very very early to attend these classes so i'm in awe of you if you do that write down where you live if you prefer that to writing down the piece the name of the piece that you're currently playing and then if you have your first question by all means go ahead and ask that in the chat box as well and i get to read it and i'll try and answer your question as well as I can and sometimes it's happened in the past when um, there have been questions and I have not quite been able to either understand the question or um, give you a good adequate answer I think since people keep coming back to this class there must be something to be gained here so don't get me wrong uh, hello Maxime Hello from France. I'm trying to learn my heart will go on. I'll try to practice often, but doing the vibrato is so tricky and complicated for me now. Yes, Maxine, that is for many people. Vibrato is really, really complicated. Um, I had, I'm thinking my heart will go on. Um, I don't know that song, I don't think. Is it a French song? Well, it's got an English title, but is it like a French kind of song if I knew it I'd play it for you <laughs> and I don't know it I'm afraid but nice to see you here and thank you for writing in the chat box if you want to and I'm waiting for your answer on that if you want to we can go into how to practice vibrato a little bit in a moment but let's wait and see if other people are also asking questions hello Linda she is here and I'll come back to you Maxine hello from Kent says Linda what are you currently playing Linda is there something that uh, you are currently learning that we find interesting to know about 
I can tell you what I'm currently learning. Uh, and that is my golden oldie, my go-to uh, piece of music is um, the Bach solo sonatas and partitas. Um, and that is, for me, it is the best study book ever. It is full of beautiful tunes and it uses absolutely every violin technique in the book. So if I want to practice the violin and I want to just come across many different aspects of violin playing I go and play a Bach solo sonata and um, it will all um, be practiced so there you go is there anyone else who wants to write about their pieces well whilst we're waiting for some more messages to come through let me answer uh, let me yeah answer Maxine's question and um, this is about vibrato. I, I have no idea, obviously, Maxine, how well advanced you are with your vibrato practice. Uh, and what you can do is to start your vibrato this way. I'm just going to reposition myself so you can see it better. And you might find this way, it gets the vibrato going. It's a song. Oh, OK, of course it is. The song from the Titanic. <laughs> Uh, that that is very very nice and you can have your vibrato in there so beautifully can't you um so when we practice vibrato it starts from the elbow and don't get confused if you may have a teacher and who teaches you a, a, a wrist vibrato um, i tend to teach an arm vibrato first and you can i can explain to you why that is because it is a, a vibrato that is using larger muscles. So the larger muscles are the muscles of my upper arm and the and muscles in my elbow, and they are going to initiate the vibrato. There we are. So this is my first exercise for vibrato. If you can do this evenly and regularly, and you might go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and do that on every single finger. I'm hoping you have your violin ready at this moment. You can perhaps, perhaps practice it with me. And that goes for everybody else who is here. If you've got your violin or get it out of your case quickly and join in with us practicing vibrato. So now I'm on the third finger, can you see? And I'm doing the same thing. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. As long as you get regular with this so that you don't go oh like that okay you're on the right tracks now i'm changing fingers i'm trying that on the third on the first finger can you see that here here we go oh perfect maxine's practicing with me everybody else joining in as well we're <laughs> that's quite a nice idea isn't it that people across the world are just practicing that same exercise. So I'm now on my fourth finger. Can you see it? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, if you're tired, if your arm's tired, give it a good twist because this is hard on the arm and you will build stamina if you practice this every day for at least a week, maybe two weeks. Carry on playing that into up to about six, seven weeks or so and you will build the strength in your shoulder and your upper arm. And then you can start the next step. Actually, what I do as well is I test, I check my fingertips. I'm not sure that you can see it now. Uh, let me see, point this at my camera. Can you see my index finger? It's got a little dent where my strings were going. Can you see? All my fingers are going there as well. My third finger, you can see that there is a line where my strings have been. And that is one single track, shall we call it. Okay. And that means that you're always in the same groove going up and down. And that helps the vibrato a lot. So occasionally check your fingertips. If you've got three or four different grooves in your fingertip, it means you're changing your finger position as you practice. And you want to keep on practicing it until you've got just one groove left. OK, and then you go and add a frequency to it. So you, you maybe you've got a loud ticking clock in your in your music room. Where you on the room where you play and then you get it even so you start to count or you might use a metronome that sort of thing now once you are established with that we're going to pretend 
we're going to first find our easiest finger. For most people, that will probably be your middle finger or your ring finger. Okay, so the middle two fingers of your hand, ignore the pinky, ignore your index finger. Okay, find the easiest finger. And then you pretend you put a drop of super glue on your finger. So the first couple of goes is like this, like you were going. And then very soon, you want your arm to keep going, but your fingertip is getting stuck because your super glue is gluing. You see, and what happens now, I'll go in slow motion so you can see it. Ah, uh, I'm just finding the best way to, to show you. There we go. Can you see my finger starts to roll? So that can only happen when you've reached a certain level of relaxation in your fingers, you see. Now these fingers ought to be up, but I am having them down so you can see my second fingers better. So if your fingers are re really stiff still because you are an early learner, then wait a little while because your vibrato won't, won't come because your fingers can't roll like that, you see. Now then we roll like this and you go back to your counting slowly though. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And now you find that really strange balance. And after all these years of teaching the violin, and I'll tell you, I've just celebrated my 40th teaching year. It's a shame, isn't it? Gosh, that's gone really quickly. Um, but after all these years, that is still mind boggling to me. And the mind needs to understand this. How can you be so flexible in your fingertip, in your fingers, when your fingertip is static on the string? You see? And that takes a while to figure that out in your head. Once you've got that figured out, that will go like that. And that already resembles a really good vibrato, doesn't it? Now then, what's your next easiest finger? Let's pretend it is your third finger. So we're going to start with the sliding because we want to make sure that that movement starts from your elbow. Okay, make it even. And then when you're ready, pop your super glue on and start to loosen that finger joint. Look, you know, I'm, I'm moving. Can you see? Again, I've got my pinky down so that you can see it, but your pinky is supposed to be over the top of your strings, okay? And I'm going like that. So if your hand then wants to do this, you're going on to a wrist vibrato. That's not what we were doing. So give it a big stretch and start again because your muscles will want to be taking the initiative. And if you find yourself going or like this and your hand goes like in a spasm, stop it, stretch your arm out and start again because you want to be in control and therefore you need to practice slowly. See? Now this might well take some time for you to master that, even on your easiest fingers. And now we're going to go on to the index finger. That is my next easiest finger. Okay, so I'm going even and make sure that I have one track in my fingertip okay and then when i'm ready you don't necessarily have to be right here you could play your finger about halfway along the string it's a lot easier but while you get your finger vibrato going okay and then you put your super glue on now initially this might well be slipping a little bit can you see i, I don't mind it if that goes up and down a little bit so long as I get some movement in my finger. Can you see that? And that is what where we're heading. And that is that strange feeling of fixing your fingertip on the string. I'm deliberately using the word gluing it to the string because you, I don't want you to actively press the finger down because if you do, then you won't move your finger anymore. It won't work anymore, will it? So your super glue does the work for you and then you roll your finger up and down. So your fingertip starts to roll forwards and backwards on the string. Okay, and that's where we're heading. Now then, once you've given that some practice, again, if you're tired, don't worry, taking some time, 
swing out your your left shoulder and your elbow and so on and now we've got one finger left our pinky and i'm making a point of also practicing the pinky because that is the weakest finger we mustn't forget it so slide along the string the movement in it initiates from your elbow right here okay be careful that you don't wave along your wrist your wrist stays straight here one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Okay. And then put your super glue on and start rolling that pinky. Now, it may well be that this is so challenging for you that you can only do it at this pace. That doesn't matter at all. That's perfectly okay because you want to get the right movement going from the work go. And for goodness sake, your pinky has got such small muscles. You want to give it some time to develop. So that will very quickly grow stronger, especially here on the side of your finger. You can feel that muscle here on the side, which I don't remember the name of. Okay. Uh, but that is what it does. That gives you control. Okay. And again, if your hand wants to do that, come away from it. Give it a big swing. Okay. And start again. Now, once you do that, that will gradually then turn into, um, let me see. Into there. So when you play these longer notes, you might then add a little bit of vibrato. And in the beginning, in the early days, you might not play vibrato here. But hold this note much longer and see if you can do that. And now you have the next obstacle because this is very similar to uh, tapping your, patting your head and rubbing your tummy because the two arms are now doing two different things. This hand is going. So if initially you go like that, that's perfectly fine. Most people actually do that, okay. But then make your bows longer and longer. And eventually you, you have one day where you think, did I just do that today? And I man managed to play a long note. So in your pieces, find the longest notes and just rest on them. Pause on your longer notes so that you allow yourself time to practice your vibrato. And from there you start to strengthen your hand, develop your vibrato, and then you can do longer notes more often and you can get them started much sooner because you, you when you first play a long note, you might think, okay, I'm going to do vibrato. How do I do that? And it takes a long time for it to come. Eventually, that will come much more quickly. So allow yourself time to make the brain realize what you're going to do while you play vibrato. And that is awesome. That is totally fine. Okay, when you play that. So don't want to, don't feel that you need to rush too quickly into those vibrato notes, but celebrate every achievement because by now you can play vibrato on your longest notes. Really good. I hope that helps you. I'm just going to read through the, uh, the chat to see um, what there is. Oh yeah, this is a song from the movie Titanic. Um, Linda says, I'm learning Mendelssohn's On the Wings of Song, but would love some more vibrato tips as I'm still struggling with that. Well, there you have it. <laughs> okay, Maxine was practicing with me uh, and Linda's joining in too. Amazing tips, thank you. It already feels easier, more or less depending on the finger. Yes, that... <laughs> you'll find that everyone who's here at this moment um, will say the same thing and still uh, um, even when we perform pieces as violin players you carefully think about that when you have really long vibrato notes which finger would sound the best so I would personally always avoid playing fourth fingers on long vibrato notes which are very exposed in my pieces so I'd rather swap fingers for a third finger or a second finger which is my favorite finger for vibrato but sometimes you can't get around it but I'll definitely avoid the fourth finger 
Oh, I'm glad that helped. That's really nice to know. So is there anyone else who has got another question? And don't get me wrong, not a single question is too silly to ask. And uh, it may well be that there are new people here who've never been to this class. Please, please ask your questions and feel free, however silly you think your question might be, there isn't ever a, a stupid question that you can ask. So, uh, so long as it is, is to do with violin playing, I'll do my best to answer it, okay? So don't, don't hesitate. If you think, oh, I've never done this before, just have a go, have a go right now. Today's your day. There's all friendly people here. And amazingly, and this is what I like so much about these live classes, amazingly, how long have I done these classes now? Linda, you might know that. A couple of years, and I do them almost every month, I actually longer, and I've only once ever um, uh, muted somebody from the class who was just being a right pain. <laughs> uh, but in all that time, all the hundreds of people who have been in this class have been friendly, supportive and communicative. So uh, don't worry about asking your question. That's really what I'm saying. Hello, Anne. Thank you for this video. I'm joining late, but I'm very happy for the tips on vibrato. I took part in a wonderful Violin for Adults program in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, that sounds really, really good. Can you tell us perhaps what you got out of that? Um, what did you do? Did you play in an orchestra? Was it a technique class? What was it? Tell us about it because I'm, they're mostly all adults here. So uh, tell us about what you learned there. That's really, really interesting. And also, let us know if you've got any questions. So like I said before, um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate, hesitate to answer, ask them. Now then, whilst we have a little break, because the questions will be coming through, I'm sure, you know that I've recently written a book, Do-It-Yourself Violin, and this is a, a, a violin method for new starters. And it's it takes you from the very, very beginning uh, uh, all the way up to in upper intermediate level. So if you want to learn to play the violin or you want to look up certain techniques, how I teach them, this book comes with, uh, I think about, I can't even remember how many, about 90 videos that you can download from the Hal Leonard website. Here in the front of the book is a number there and it's got a playback with it as well. So you can see it's got a number here that you can enter into their website and then you have access to the videos that accompany this book and also to the backing tracks that accompany this book. So this is a, an interesting method if you're learning to play in, as, a, as an adult and I'll tell you how this came about. At one point I got a phone call from the CEO of Hal Leonard and who said, would you like to write a book, um, a violin method teach yourself how to play the violin and use only popular tunes and throughout my career I've always thought that that would be a, an immensely nice thing for violinists to learn pieces like, like the Titanic that one's not in the book actually so uh, popular tunes I have three children and two of them played the the saxophone and the guitar and I was always very jealous because they always learned pieces that they already knew and here I was teaching my students pieces that they did not know like baroque pieces and classical pieces so I took on that challenge uh, and and wrote it and here it is it's now here and the feedback from people using it has been absolutely amazing and people have said oh we so want it something like that so if it is you who wants to do something like that it's got everything in from Rod Stewart to Queen to Disney all sorts all sorts and also a couple of um, uh, uh, classical pieces so uh, you can get that book from my website primestrings.com in Europe it is not yet been launched and I expect I've, I've been told that it will come around mid-April but you can um, pre-order the book from my website 
and um, in America it's available from halena.com and from Amazon all the usual usual outlets so go ahead and buy it there let me go back to the chat now and see Julie I'm completely new and I struggle with tuning my violin. Do you recommend any application on the phone or buy a separate tuner? It doesn't matter, Julie, what um, what sort of app you fancy. I, I'll have a look. I'm, I've recently cleared out my phone, so it, it may be that I have not um, kept them on my phone. Let me see. Um, no, I've I've taken them all off. Let me go to the app store and show you. Um, they are just a little bit sort of um, uh, yeah, a bit mechanical in sound, but there are also tuning apps that have got green and red lights, so that you can you can see. Let me find the app store, and then I'll have I'll talk you through. Now, major challenge when you do live class, where to find the app store um violin tuning yeah i used to have this one i don't know if you can see that violin tuner app and i think this one let me download it onto my phone i think this one just gives you the sounds uh No, oh, is my sound off? Let me see. You see, it's like a... And this one doesn't actually... Oh, doesn't actually have any lights. So if you can find one that has lights, green and red, it will tell you it's too... The note that you're playing is too high or too flat. That is very helpful. Um, this just gives you the sound, you see. You could also get some sort of electronic tuning devices that you can clip on to your um, violin. And most people clip them on to the bottom peg, sort of here. You clip it on and then have the display so that you can see it from here. So you clip it on there and you have the screen pointing at your face. And then play and you can see the green and red lights showing how to get higher or lower. But there is also... Um, on my uh, YouTube channel there are also violin tuning videos so a video about how to tune the E string and a video about how to tune the A string um, let me find a link or oh, I can't access that link right now because I'm on YouTube doing this you see um, I'll put it in the I'll make a note and I'll put it in the description below the video once it's finished uh, tuning videos okay let me have a look uh, it's very satisfying to quickly play some popular tune it's motivating I use an app oh Maxime says I use an app called simply tuner okay uh, gives you the direction in which you yes and uh, that is exactly what what I mean as well Maxime says simply tuner gives you the direction in which you need to tune the notes it's helpful for beginners um, and then what you can do as well if your violin's wildly out of tune but you have got one string all the strings are tuned five notes apart in, in Bosch music terms it's called violin the violin is tuned in fifths so if you go and start on the D string if you've got one string you could sing da, 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 da. that gives you the sound for the A you see now once you've got the A so you might have to sing that about 10 times see that's the E or you could go down and that way you can find the lower strings as well so you could sing it you could use a tuning app you could use a good old tuning fork. Now, let me see where my tuning fork is. Here we are. And did you know tuning forks, they're interesting little things. Um, what you can do is hit it 
and then put it on your jawbone and it will resonate in your ear and I can very clearly hear the A here or you can put it on your violin can you hear and the violin amplifies the sound of your tuning fork I, when I first got to know that I thought it was absolutely amazing that's why I'm sharing this with you maybe you think duh that's I knew that already so that's okay simply tune up it is then really good really good one if you have lights that indicate which way to tune it I hope that helps Julie um so because that is the diff difficulty if you don't go to a teacher to have your violin tuned properly and when your violin's tuned properly each day or each week when you go to a class it becomes stable over time now violins are a natural products so strings move over time depending on the atmospheric pressure so if you have a thunderstorm your violin might well go out of tune or when the weather turns very damp or very dry your strings will change um, but the f the more frequently you tune your violin the more stable it becomes um, so also when you when you tune your violin try not to completely loosen it or tighten it way too tight because those strings will stretch and then you get more and more movement so use little little bits of tuning if you have them use the fine tuners here I have got just one but you can get these integrated fingerboards where there are four fine, tu fine tuners with which you can tune much more easily compared with the pegs this is really for the rough work and that is really for the finer tuning all right my only problem is my age and better of disease i still try your suzuki lessons thank you well for your online lesson <laughs> you're never too old to learn Guido. so um good luck and i'm in awe of you i wish i could still play the violin when i'm 75 so, so is it 75 i think so we won't mention that again uh, it's great that you're learning with the Suzuki lessons they're made with you guys in mind so people and this is why these courses are uh, step by step and they they just take the time I know that you guys are not in a hurry to play any big concertos anytime and that way you learn much more thoroughly so with fewer lessons you can get a lot further Whereas some of my teenage students, you know, they want to play the biggest pieces tomorrow. And uh, it's much better to have some time and to actually enjoy the learning process, isn't it? So Linda has another message. Please, could you recommend a book about learning the higher positions? I'm OK with the third and working on the second. OK, that's good. We talked about that in our last uh, live class last month. But I would like to do some simple tunes for practice. Yes, let me get it from my um, uh, cupboard. <coughs> it's at the top of the shelf, so um, because I use it all the time. And this is how I used to learn. So I'm a little bit biased, but I think still that this is the nicest book. This is um, a German version. It comes in an English version as well. And it's called playing, in English it's called playing in the higher positions. And it is the fourth to the tenth position. Now, I don't know if you knew. And it's written by actually Erich und Elmer Dofflein. Super, super method with lots of really interesting and wonderfully beautiful pieces. Um, I don't know if you know that there are officially 13 positions on the violin and positions for those of you who don't know that um, it's like on the guitar you'd have frets won't you and it indicates where you can have your fingers in different positions those are the positions so you when you first start learning you start in the first position then when you get a little bit further advanced you might go into the second position or the third position and this book is all about the fourth to the thirteenth position and this is what they call the eternal snowfields because there's sometimes some rosin here 
uh, and that is where you are playing. When you're in the highest positions, you play like this, okay? Don't worry about it if you've only just started learning, um, but just so you know what we're talking about, you see? So um, Linda was asking the fourth to the tenth position. Um, uh, no, Linda was asking about a book about higher position. So this is my recommended book, as I said. Fourth to the tenth position. Actually, the fourth position is super, super useful. Uh, so I definitely learn that. Uh, and the fifth position is super, super easy because the fifth position uses all the same fingers as the first position, except you play them on a string down. So you go very high up on the A string and on the D string and so on. So that's the fifth position. And then we learn the sixth position, which is a little bit higher, which is two positions up from the fourth. Uh, and beyond that, you become more uh, practiced in playing the higher positions anyway, the higher notes. So we don't actually learn the seventh to the thirteenth position because by then you have got a lot more experience and you will be able to work those notes out. But if you get the positions one, two, three, and four done, and five because it's easy, then you're well on your way. You've only got the six then to go, and that's your position playing done, your position practice done. So you're well on your way. Doffline, book five. Um, in, in German, it's called Das Geigenschulwerk, work, which means um, the violin method. The violin method. Um, playing in the higher positions by Doffline. Madeline. Hi, Henriette. How does one get a violin for a child to learn the violin? Do people rent or buy? What's the most cost effective way? And what is the education pathway for violin? Good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, in my experience, from when I used to teach lots of children, I used to go into schools and teach hundreds of them, um, everyone always rented because children, you know, they drop the things sometimes. Violins are remarkably resilient things. They don't actually break that easily, even when they get dropped. But uh, they get bashed around a little bit and then a child might overnight change their mind from wanting to play the violin to not wanting to play the violin um it used to always be that music shops used to do like a hire and buy scheme so that you could hire an instrument um for a, a given number of weeks or months and then the higher fee would deduct it off would be deducted off the price of the violin if you decided to buy it at the end of the higher period that sounds a pretty ideal way of going about it to me because um, you'd give the child the opportunity to try to play and whether they like it or not it really doesn't matter the the losses are limited but you have to bear in mind as well that children grow and as they grow they move up to a different size violin so when they're really really little uh, children start to play on a 16th violin or an eighth and then they move up to a quarter size violin and then a half size and a three quarter size until they eventually get to play on a full size violin when they have really grown. So when they're 13 or 14 or so, they go on to full size violin. So that is how it works. Now, I used to have about 50 little violins in all sizes and I would just swap them over. So that was very easy for parents. I'm not sure that many teachers do that, but it seemed to make sense for my teaching situation. I don't know where you live and I don't know about what what is possible where you live. So you might even get to an arrangement with a music shop if they rent you a violin that you can, uh, if your teacher tells you to move to the next size, because that is also sometimes a southern thing, isn't it? Children grow in spurts. They don't grow equal amounts every day no one day you think oh it's still fine and the next day it's like with shoes isn't it and the next day they they're too small the violins are too small as well so you have to sometimes act really quickly and think okay we need to now move on to a bigger size so maybe your violin hire shop might swap it over for you for a bigger size that just depends on the possibilities that there are 
um, and I don't know where you live what what is possible the thing is that when you buy an instrument obviously you then have to fork out a new purchase price for a bigger size violin and then again and then again until they get to a full size violin so I would say that is probably the least cost effective way but it depends on your personal environment whether it is possible to hire now also what is the matter here in England is that whenever you buy a new instrument you pay VAT on it and some dealers instrument dealers have got trade-in schemes so they would take back what they sold you previously and then you could use that amount and the amount of the value of your previous instrument against the next instrument that you buy but these are not for the most basic student instruments so when your child is a little bit more advanced you might think of some to do of doing something like that so that you buy a slightly more expensive instrument of which you can then take a section of the value of that instrument and use that to buy their future instruments um, here in England on every purchase you have to pay VAT so what you lose in any case is the 20% VAT whenever you swap an instrument over but there might, might be an amount of money that you could use towards your next instrument so that's another another possibility but that doesn't work for the really cheap instruments now I would never never encourage anyone to buy the cheapest instrument for a child because children have really good ear for quality sound and they will be much more likely to stick with learning to play the violin when uh, the quality of the sound is slightly better so if you can possibly afford it buy something a little bit up from the bottom range of instruments I'm hoping that my rattling on is helpful um, oh you are in London okay all right so maybe there are hire and buy schemes and I don't know whether you learn with a private teacher or whether you are in a music school or in another organization that helps your child to learn speak to them as well but bear these things in mind and um, the the last thing I would do is buy an instrument on Amazon now in recent years um, uh, people have always said and I've always said also do not buy any Chinese instruments but in recent years the quality of some Chinese instruments has gone up dramatically so maybe we should now start to take um, um, that that thing that I just said do not buy any Chinese instruments with a pinch of salt because that you can get some better ones but by all means speak to the teacher who teaches your child uh, and they will be able to help you because maybe they use a certain violin dealer or violin shop uh, and it's not that you can get a discount but you just know that um, the shop knows what the teacher expects in the way of quality you see and my pupils always go to the same violin maker who knows that if they give them rubbish violins which they don't I will send them straight back you see so now they get really good quality instruments and they can they can just tell that uh, what what I expect in a sort of quality instrument but they need to be better than what you think oh it's only for a child like when my son used to play football I buy him the cheapest football boots that may work for football and maybe maybe that was the worst thing I could have done but um, it doesn't work like that for violins you have to really invest a little bit to give them a fair chance because we all know that playing the violin is a difficult instrument you don't want to make it even harder than it already is for especially for young children I hope that helps and that, that goes for adults actually as well is to buy I always say to people buy an instrument as expensive as you can possibly afford because it's always going to pay off um, it lasts you longer it gives you a lot more pleasure and if you want to exchange it for something else it's more likely if you bought something decent in the first place that the trade-in value is more so you can use that towards an upgrade when the time comes um, because 
violins can actually stop progress if you're not careful. If you're working on um, working on quality sound or tone colours and the violin can only do one type of sound and those colours are not built in in the quality workmanship of the instrument then you might practice and pay for lessons as much as you want to but it's not coming out and your child or yourself you will not learn to play these more advanced techniques if your instrument doesn't allow you you see so you want to spend as much as you can afford it's always always paying off what is the pathway, pathway in this country for learning the violin? Do per, people learn privately and take exams somewhere? Are there music schools? Thank you. Um, there's various different pathways and it is difficult for me to tell because they have a lot of things have changed in the last 20 years. Um, some people near where I live, I can only talk for what, but I'll give you no example. Um, people go to private teachers or private teachers go into schools so when I used to go into schools um, the parents would pay me direct the the schools were not involved so I was a private teacher but working in school during school time so that's one way that I also have a private teaching practice at home so also children and adults come to my house for lessons so that, that is also the private part of it. Um, but also, there are still some county music services that, ha that employ teachers of any instrument and they send them into schools. But because um, that aspect of violin learning has been reduced by the government, there's just not as much money available. And certainly in some areas that has been abolished altogether. So there are no more music lessons in some schools. Uh, but uh, to to save money, when there is a provision for music tuition in schools, um, they group pupils together. So they might have 20 minutes of violin playing um, in a group of five. And I'd say that is probably not the best way to learn to play the violin. I am slightly biased here because I only teach one-on-one -on -one lessons and that way I can see really, really good progress. And I have seen many children that have come away from that school system that want to carry on and learning properly. It's more like, in my view, but this is a very personal view, and I'm sure if you talk to teachers who teach in that situation, they will say, oh no, they learn really, really well. Um, but my personal view is that you cannot learn an instrument as difficult as the violin in a proper way with a view to uh, my lesson plan is always geared to um, a, a conservatory entry point at the end, you see. So um, we take the long view and we take the best possible path. Um, so different opinions vary on that, but it's it's probably a good idea to start if there is a school opportunity for them to learn in school to let them try that so so that you can see whether they like the instrument how they get on with it have they got any talent or do they find it incre incredibly difficult to do so you can gauge that because when you enroll for private lessons that is a whole lot more expensive but then also um there is more demand so uh, what i mean by that is that uh, private teachers are generally much stricter and they uh, require a certain amount of progress um, and then you can or you don't have to work towards grade exams and when i first came to the uk i was not familiar with grade exams at all because i where i grew up there wasn't such a thing at all so i went through conservatoire without ever having taken a grade exam and people find that very strange when I tell them that because people ask me when did you take your grade 8 and I did not ever take a grade 8 because at a higher level of playing whenever you enroll for a, a youth orchestra or for um, a professional course you are always going to have to audition whether you have done any grade exams or not and I always I often discourage people from taking grade exams first of all grades 1 to 5 in my view are completely pointless because they ask children to 
do things that are actually physically very difficult to do well. And of course you can drill children and you can ram it in them how to play them, but it, it often takes the fun out of playing. Um, some of my pupils do take grade exams, um, but on my terms and not on the terms of the parent, because I get also get a lot of parents that say, even to the point where people say, I've now paid you an X amount of money, why has Johnny not taken grade one? Well, there might be many reasons why Johnny has not yet taken grade one. So there is always that money issue that is in the way, you see. So I have very mixed feelings about grade exams and I have seen the disappointment if children don't get the grade that they deserve or they think they deserve or their parents think they deserve or that I think they deserve. So there is, um, I have very mixed feelings about them. All right, now that's enough of that, I think. Um, Flinda says, I once saw on YouTube a violin class practicing vibrato to music. It looked very helpful. Have you ever done this? No, I I have never. Is that sort of miming or I, I don't, I've never ever seen that. So maybe uh, you can elaborate on that a little bit more. Practicing vibrato to music. Okay, so maybe without playing and just playing the vibrato. I'd say, why would you do that? Because you can do it in a piece of music. But there you go. Let me know a little bit more of the background of that. Uh, Kersey says, hello, Kersey. Nice to see you here. I took finger tape off two weeks ago. Need to get the glue of the fingerboard. Yes, <laughs> that is the difficult thing, isn't it? Lots of teachers teach with finger tape to indicate where the notes are. Uh, and then you need to try and take the glue off and what you might use is cleaning alcohol and cleaning cleaning alcohol is alcohol ketonatis 70 percent and you have to be very very careful when you use it because if you spill drops of that stuff on the varnish of your violin it will dissolve the varnish so what we do is um, cover the violin with a piece of cloth like that you just put it underneath cover it like that and then you can put it on here and and it will clean your strings beautifully and it will take all the grease from playing the violin from your finger grease like sweaty fingers but also glue off your strings and your fingerboard but do do cover this up because any spills will have um, a little mark afterwards, unfortunately. I hope that helps. Anne says, not enough space here to describe the Brooklyn classes. I worked up to playing Bartok duets though. We had lots of fun. After every eight week session, all the classes performed a piece. Ah, oh, that sounds really, really good. And the Bartok duets, aren't they wonderful? For all of you, if you've never listened to Bartok duets, go and find them on YouTube. And they are the most beautiful little things. And I don't know if you know the background of them. Bartok um, grew up, I think, in Hungary. And he, um, he suddenly thought um, he was a composer. And he, <laughs> he's a male composer, Bela Bartok. And uh, he, he suddenly realised that with old people passing away, a lot of the cultural heritage of folk songs that people used to sing in their homes like folk tunes lullabies to their babies and so would uh, disappear eventually uh, with old people uh, passing away because people did other things and didn't pass on that cultural heritage to their children and then to their children's children and so on so he started um, collecting these tunes so he went into the countryside and wrote down the tunes he would just knock on people's doors and say to old ladies and old men can you sing me the songs of your childhood and then he would write them down and he and Bartok then transformed them into modern idiom pieces and this is how the the violin duets emerged and they are just wonderful and you wouldn't recognize them now because they're sort of much more modern idiom but they're lovely lovely to 
to listen to but also to play and they're not too hard to play although when you play them properly as duets they can be quite challenging right let me have another look <laughs> Wendy says hello violin champions hello Henriette hello Wendy and indeed violin champions and I always say to people you are absolutely awesome when you're learning to play the violin by yourself and when you get that going and keep that going so all credit to you definitely violin champions uh, Ma Madeline says coming back to these children's exams what is the point in exams then Yes, uh, that is my question as well. Many people use them as quality control for the teachers, uh, which is completely ridiculous because there is no link between how you teach exams and how you actually connect with the child and learn them techniques that you as a teacher find valuable. Um, people just really like to keep track on, especially those who want you to go through grade one two three four five six seven eight and uh, so there are people who who value that and who think it's easy to say oh my child is grade six or oh my child is grade seven uh, to people who've got knowledge about this it doesn't actually mean that they the child then can do all the things that are required for grade six or seven it's a bit of a weird one that but yeah, in, in England, people seem to be very, very keen on grade exams. Mostly parents seem to be very great, keen on grade exams and children not so much. Having said that, my pupils all take grade six and seven and eight. And people say, oh, why is that? Um, the Associated Board says that um, they give credit for uh, when for UCAS applications. Uh, and when they've got uh, a, a merit or a distinction in the higher grades, grade six, seven or eight, they can use that, uh, they get a certain amount of points for it, which they can use towards their UCAS application. That only works for disadvantaged children uh, who don't otherwise have any other opportunities to uh, expand themselves outside of school. Um, so... The more privileged children, who are generally the ones that I get in my violin studio, and she is the one. Again, as a beginner, with my basic questions, would you ever recommend wearing any ear protection for your left ear or is it detrimental to learning hearing it properly? I have never done that, and I don't know of anyone who does it, but I sometimes talk in this, in this chat about ear protection, um, only if it really, really annoys you. And there are people with tinnitus who find that if they stick a, like a little earplug in their left ear, it, it is easier to hear the violin, so I can see that. But other than that, I would say that probably, but I don't speak from experience here at all, um, it's probably easier if you kept both ears open so that you could hear properly what was going on. I hope that answers all of your questions thank you so much for all the really valuable questions that you've asked here today if you've enjoyed this class and um, you want to uh, contribute to this class click on the little dollar sign to the right of your chat box and then you can either buy super stickers or super chats via youtube you might also go and look in the description below this video because there are other ways that you can support um, the Pro Am Strings YouTube channel. One is buy me a coffee. Another one is watch as many YouTube videos as you can. Uh, and the next one is share the videos with your friends. You can also use PayPal and just go on info at proamstrings.com and show your support there. So there's many different ways and you can take out memberships to Pro Am Strings. And what memberships do is they support me as a creator and I really enjoy making the YouTube videos for you. Uh, at the moment I'm producing just membership videos because I've got some nice thing in the making but I'm not going to talk more about that than just this okay um, so th those are different ways that you can support me as a creator on YouTube so thank you very much for being here today 
We've had a really nice and varied chat, I think, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon in the next lesson. Bye-bye, everyone.